Good morning. Good to see you. Thank you so much for joining uh, us for worship here at PCN. If your Bibles, get them out, get them open. Uh, if you haven't been with us, we've been in the book of Acts for about the last month or so. We're going to continue in Acts uh, chapter 17 today. Acts chapter 17, lean into somebody, uh, grab a few Bible. If technology cooperates, we'll throw the scripture on the screen for you here so you can follow along. But we've been in this series of messages looking through the book of Acts, and we've seen that the, the, whole, the Holy Spirit has come and empowered his church, right? That we might move out and share this gospel message that God has given us in supernatural power to every person throughout the world, to the ends of the earth, he said in Acts chapter 1-8, amen? That this message would, would spread from the people in Jerusalem uh, throughout Judea and Samaria, or Jerusalem and Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth, and we're part of that mission, amen, to today. To the ends of the earth. So if you've been with us, we've seen to this point, this new church that is established and started here uh, has now scattered upon the death of Stephen and the gospel message has, has spread beyond Jerusalem and Judea and the gospel has been shared and received into Samaria and is making its way to the ends of the earth. So, so the fulfillment of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, this sort of overarching theme of the book of Acts is actually taking place. If you're with us a couple weeks ago, we saw that the church was planted in Antioch, and that church became a great sending church, and the mission became missions, and Paul and Barnabas were sent out and began to share the gospel throughout Greece and in Asia Minor, and now we're going to come to chapter 17, and, and Paul and Barnabas have actually uh, parted ways, they've gone different directions, and Paul is now accompanied by Silas and they head out again okay and so if you look in your Bibles you'll see sort of a, a thumbnail version of where they went by looking at the headers between the section of verses and so as we head into chapter 17 above the first verse it says in Thessalonica and so Paul and Silas have arrived in Thessalonica to share the gospel as you read that passage we find that trouble breaks out the people there aren't happy with them preaching Jesus and his resurrection and so they drive them out, and they move out of Thessalonica and on to Berea. And so the next little header you see is Paul and Silas are now in Berea. And as you read through there, what happens is the Jews from Thessalonica follow them to Berea and stir the crowd up there. And the same thing, same trouble breaks out in Berea. And so now they have to act again. And, and this time they kind of split up, and they send Paul to the coast to the city of Athens. And so now Paul finds himself in Athens. And this is amazing to me and so powerful that this story of Jesus that started in this upper room in a remote city in Judea is now going to be proclaimed in, in the cultural center, the, the philosophical center, the mythological center of the world at that time. Which, as we said a couple of weeks ago, uh, this story of God is global. Amen. It's not a local, it's not American. It's, this is a global story of God, and we see that unfolding here in the scripture. This morning, what I want to look at is what I think is one of the greatest sermons in the history of the church. And in this message, we're going to see some things that are true about us. Okay? So God is going to talk to you specifically about things that are true about you right here in this message. Uh, and I think that it's vitally important that we understand these things and come to believe these things that are true about us. Because understand, these things are also true about the folks that, that we are called to minister to. Okay? The folks that we're called to reach the gospel for, these things are also true about them. So we need to get this today. We need to get this for us because we have a mission and we have a purpose. Amen? We see that point right away when Paul arrives in Athens, that Paul was there for a purpose. This wasn't a vacation for Paul. He was run out of Thessalonica. He was run out of Berea. Now he winds up in Athens. So new city, new context, new circumstances new people, but the same purpose. So where are we now? We're in Athens. Great. Well, now the people of Athens are about to hear the story of the resurrection of Jesus. Amen? And, and if that's your purpose, it doesn't matter where you are. Okay? Because you can tell the people at this job about Jesus just like you can tell the people at that job about Jesus. You can tell the people in this town about Jesus just like you can tell them in that town about Jesus. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean we don't get disappointed sometimes. If you like the job and you lost the job, 
um, if you liked where you lived and you lost that, or this breaks down and this circumstance didn't go as planned. That stuff happens. But, but, but all this means is that, that that stuff doesn't throw shade on our purpose. Okay? Our purpose prevails and remains no matter where we are and what the circumstance of life is. We still have that same purpose. So Paul arrives in Athens. If you look to the text, it says that he was greatly distressed to see there were so many idols. That word in the Greek, distressed, means that it was, it was gut-wrenching for him. His heart was broken. Can I just say to you that as the people of God, sin should break our hearts? And, and being people that have hope in Jesus, it should drive us out. It should drive us out into the world with this hope that we have in Christ. And we see that in Paul's life. He, he went to the synagogue, which would have been his normal custom as a Jew, and, and reasoned there. That word, it's a back and forth. They talked about one thing. He reasoned Jesus with them, with the people in the church, in the synagogue. But he also went out into the marketplace where the common folks were. And he, and he talked to the philosophers, different groups of people, the common folks, men and women, people who were learned. He talked to everybody about Jesus. Paul was all about Jesus. And so what did he do? He talked to people about Jesus. Okay. They say to him, you're bringing some, some new crazy teaching to Athens. We've never heard anything like this before, and so we're going to need you to go to the, the city council. They called it the Areopagus. You're going to need to go talk to them about it. This was a group of people who made all the decisions in the city. Okay? So they decided the political future of the city. They decided what philosophies you're allowed to share out in the public square. So you're going to go need to talk to them about it. They were the decision makers. And so Paul has to go meet with the Areopagus, this council. And so right there in the shadow of this temple to the goddess Athena, the cultural heartbeat, the philosophical, the mythological heartbeat of the, of the known world at that time, Paul walks in. He arrives before the council. No plan of his own, no, no advanced warning. Probably didn't have a lot of sermon prep. And now he has to stand before these people, and these guys want to hear from him. They said, we, we heard you've been talking some new talk in town. You've been talking about some guy named Jesus. We'd like to know about what you're talking about. And so Paul stands up in the area of Opagus, and he, and he addresses these people. And again, I think it's one of the greatest sermons ever preached. And uh, it's amazing that we have access to it, amen, that we get to read it and, and study it. And uh, I just want you to know today, this message wasn't just for the people of Athens. It was for you and me. This message of God says some powerful things about you and me. Because when he's saying people of Athens, he's really saying people of the world. Sophisticated thinking people. People searching through philosophy. Anybody who's, who's searching for the truth. Anybody who's using your mind to try to figure this out and stir up What's the meaning of life? What are the possibilities? What's going on here in this life? That's who this message is for. This is a message for all people. So I want to look at this message together, and, and I'd like to point out a few of the key things that he's saying to us, you and me this morning. And, and again, it's the same things for the people who we're called to disciple and minister to. So let's look at this. If you have Acts 17 in front of you, we're going to pick it up at verse 22 together. If you want to follow along with me, Acts 17 Beginning at verse 22, this is the Apostle Paul, I'm sorry, this is Luke writing, and he says that Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and he said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. Can I just pause there and say that snapshot, that's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing today, friends, in Painesville, Ohio. There are people who are searching. People, people are looking. People are striving. People are longing. People with questions. And what we're doing is we're stepping into the gap and saying, hey, you, you know what you're looking for? I know what it is that you're looking for. Okay? You know what you're longing for? I know what you've been longing for. You know what you've been searching for? I know what you've been searching for because I did that same search myself. And at the end of my search, I found Jesus. And I'd like to tell you about him. That's what we do. Amen? So Paul makes this connection with them. And he uses one of their own idols. They would have had thousands of idols there in Athens. Too many to count. And their mindset basically was, we're in charge of the gods. 
Okay? We, we create the idols. We, we name the gods. But just in case we forgot one, we name them all. We got names for all these gods. But just in case we forgot one, we don't want to upset anybody. We don't want to... Uh, we want to curry the favor of all the gods. And so just in case we missed one, we're going to name this idol to the unknown god. Okay? So Paul sees this idol to an unknown god, and he says, this god that you don't know, I'm going to proclaim this one to you. Let me tell you about this god. And so he begins to do that in verse 24. He says, the god who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. The first thing I want you to write down, if you're a note taker, I encourage you to write this down. First thing we can pull out of this is for, for you, for me, for everybody else who's searching for meaning, if you're looking for that ultimate meaning in life, you need to understand that life begins with God and not with us. Okay? If you're fine looking for ultimate meaning, friends, life begins with God and not with you. God made the world and everything in it. And Paul says, we don't decide where he lives. We don't decide where we get to put him. Okay? In other words, what, what he's saying to you and to me today is that God is not man-made. God is the maker of man. And what you're going to find, if you get out there and try to share the gospel with people, you're going to find a lot of people who, who might be likely willing to discuss God with you. Okay? They don't mind talking about God. It's just the God that they created. But you're not going to find ultimate meaning talking about a God that you created. What kind of God would it be if you're the one who created it? That would make you God, wouldn't it? And there are a lot of people who are sitting on that throne today, and yet they're still searching for meaning. And see, ultimate meaning comes when we realize that, that, that God is the creator, God is the initiator of everything and we don't get to decide who God is okay and really we don't get to decide who we are either okay God reveals who he is and when God reveals who he is then God reveals to us who we are in him that's where we get our identity friends and it begins with God and doesn't begin with you and me okay second thing in this passage uh, that it says about us is that um, we are not random or accidental do you believe that today? That you're not random, you're not accidental, we're not disconnected from ultimate meeting, that we're not really guided by our own will and choices and desires, that we're not accidental. We didn't just crawl up out of the ooze at some point, okay? On the contrary, you and I are very much intended in this moment. Paul says God is the maker of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples and idols made by human hands and, verse 25, He's not served by human hands as if he needs anything. Like, what are we supposed to give to God that he needs from us? He said, on the contrary, here's how it worked. That God gave you life. God gave you breath. God gave you everything that you have. And so, in fact, that you're sitting here this morning and you have life and you have breath and you have everything that God gave you is a sign that you have intrinsic value woven into your being because understand today, friend, you are the idea and the creation of Almighty God. You didn't just happen. Okay? God gave it all to you. Now, it all belongs to God, but he gave it to you. God gave you life. God gave you breath. God gave you everything. Which means no one can take that away from you. It's not earned or conferred. It is intrinsic in creation that you have value, you have origin, and you have a purpose. That's what Paul is saying to the council on Athens in Athens on that day. He said, you are not random, people of Athens. Can I say that to you, people of Painesville? You're not random. You're not accidental. You were intended by Almighty God, lives of value, lives of purpose. And friends, listen, unless and until you understand that and believe that about yourself, there's no way you can communicate that with somebody else. You're not random or accidental. You are created and loved by Almighty God with value and purpose, and you have been sent. The third thing he says about us, and I love this, he says that all of your life has been orchestrated by God. Listen to the way that Paul writes it in verse 26. I'm sorry that Paul says it. From one man he made all the nations... That they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the exact 
places where they should live. What that means for you and me is that when you showed up to the dorm room, when you moved into that apartment, when you moved to Painesville and bought the new house, above the door it already said, God knew you were going to be here. Okay? Because he determines the boundaries of our lives. He determines the seasons of our lives. He determines where we would live. He orchestrated all of it. Why? So that you could have a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus. He's orchestrating your life so that you can have a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus. God is positioning things in your life so that you can have a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus. It's why you live in this place, in this time, in this town, in this state, in this country, so that you'll have a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus and that through you, others will also. It's not accidental. It's why you're here. You're not here in this place in this time by accident. You're also not at PCN by accident. You may have no plans to be here this morning. Maybe just like, I guess I'm going to church today and now you're here. Maybe a friend tricked you, thought you are going to Starbucks and now you're at church. I don't know. It didn't catch God by surprise. It's not an accident you're here this morning, okay? The families and the children who are in our preschool every day are not here by accident. The community groups who use our building every week are not here by accident. The people who are blessed by our food pantry every weekend are not here by accident. The people who aren't even here yet, who someday, uh, Lord willing, will walk through our doors, will not do so by accident. Okay? It's all orchestrated by God. That people would have a personal encounter, a personal meeting with Jesus, the only one who can save them. And that's why what we do here is so important. Because PCN is part of the orchestrated plan of God. Okay? To help people find what they're searching for. Because understand, people are searching. You're, you may not think your coworker's searching, she's searching. The way your neighbor acts, you may not think he's searching, he's searching. Paul says God orchestrated the times and the boundaries and the seasons where everyone would live. Why? Because you, me, and everybody else, we are seekers. Okay? That's the next thing that's true about us and everybody else we talk to. You're a seeker. The Bible says that. The Bible says that, that God put heaven in your heart. You're a seeker. Paul writes this in verse 27. He said, God intended that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. In other words, the reason why God has us where we are, the reason why he allows all the situations and the circumstances to happen, if I can be so bold as to say this morning, this morning friends, that the reason that God allows hardship into your life is because no one's testimony is, man, you know what, I was, I was crushing it at life. My life was perfect, my marriage is perfect, my kids are perfect, my house is perfect, my job's perfect. My finances are perfect, our, 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 our garden's perfect, my dog's perfect. Everything in my life is perfect. You know what, what the heck, let's go look, look for Jesus. Have you heard that testimony? I haven't heard that testimony. What you probably heard, and maybe your life experience might have been, man, when the bottom fell out, when my spouse left, when I lost that job, when, when, we, when we had to file bankruptcy or, 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 or the market collapsed, when, when I heard that diagnosis, I heard that doctor say cancer for the first time, when my, when my dad died, I was so empty, I realized that I was lost and and I was broken, and I was so frustrated, and so angry, and, and so confused in life. And I realized there has to be something more to life than this. And somehow my eyes were opened. And it was in that moment I realized I needed Jesus. And I sought after God and, and surrendered my life and, and said, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need you. And Christ was not far off, the scripture says. And he moved in. And he saved me, and he changed my life, and now I have an eternal future with him. That's a story we've probably heard a thousand times, right? 
Why? Because we've been blinded. The Bible says we've been blinded by, by the God of this age. And we don't get it when we see the sunrise and the sunset. We don't get it when we look up and see the stars and the moon in the sky or when we dip our toes into the sand or the ocean or we look at the splendor of the Grand Canyon or the mountains. We don't get it. And so it takes God using the thorns of our flesh so that he can reach us, to awaken us to what, honestly, we already knew, that there has to be something more to life than all of this. You're a seeker. Here's the great news, friends, and this is worth the price of admission today. Your searching has an end. You believe that today? Your searching has an end, and you don't have to have an arm that can reach up to heaven because God had a way to reach all the way down to the earth. His name is Jesus, and he is not far from any one of us. Somebody needs to hear that today, and the rest of the world needs to hear it too. The next thing we're going to learn together about us is that it is God's intention, friends, that we would be bilingual in this world. Back in the very first week, we talked about Pentecost, or in the second week, one of them, about at that moment where the Holy Spirit came and the disciples were then able to speak and people could understand them in, in different languages and, 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 and the message of God was now going global. That continues today where God expects us to be bilingual. God wants us, the people of the world, to know that although he is not like the world, he understands their world. Although God is not like the world, he understands the world. And, and the way that the world is going to come to understand that, that God is not like them, but he understands their world, is that we, the church, are going to have some sort of understanding of the world. Okay? Paul demonstrates this brilliantly, if you look in the text. He rolls into Athens. He, he sees all these idols. He picks out this one with an unknown God. And he probably says to him, himself what any good preacher uh, would understand, like, that's a good sermon illustration right there. Like, I'm going to use that at some point. Maybe right now, uh, maybe I'll save it for later, but if I can do a jam, I'm going with the unknown, unknown God thing. Right? And, and friends, we ought to be doing that. Can I say that to you today? We ought to be doing that in, in our everyday life. You ought to be rolling into, into work or to the grocery store or the conversation with your neighbor at the mailbox or, or at a family meeting or whatever, walking into situations looking for a common ground moment. And maybe you use it in that conversation right there, or maybe you just hang on to it for a later time. But you search for, for common ground, a way to make the gospel clear to people. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I, I love the way the, the New Living Translation says this. It says, I try to find common ground with everybody. Doing everything I can to save some. I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. Now, it doesn't mean the message changes. Okay, understand that today. Our message will never change. Paul's message never changed. It says he went in the synagogue, he talked about Jesus. He went out in the marketplace, talked to people about Jesus. Our message is Jesus, amen? The blood of Jesus, the power of Jesus, salvation alone through Jesus, it's the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection by the power of God, our message of Jesus, and that won't change. But come on, friends, we got to find a way to find common ground with people in society. Paul comes to this moment in verse 28. He's like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to use one of your poems. I'm familiar with your poetry. I'm familiar with your poets. I'm going to use a poem from Erastus. I'm familiar with that, that poem, and it's going it, it, to fit right here. I'm going to use one, one of your own pagan poems. I'm going to use it to make my point about how God could not possibly be an idol made out of stone or gold or silver. And so I'll just pull that out at the right time. And, 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 and so he says, you know, because in him we live and move and have our being. You know, just as your poet said, we are his offspring. And I imagine in that moment a light bulb went off for somebody and they were like, you got to be kidding me. You're talking about a God who is so far above us, so far above everything we've ever thought of in our lives. But you're telling me this God can come down to where I am and, and I can meet with him. My life can be joined into his. 
This is being bilingual. See, friends, we don't, we don't want to be people who only know how to speak church to the world. You know what I mean by that? If, if all you know how to speak is churchies and, and can't have a normal conversation with somebody, there's a lot of people who you'll never be able to reach with the gospel. Because they're not on that level. They, just, they don't understand it. They've never been in church. They don't, right? Now, we also don't want to be people who only speak the world to, to, to the world, right? Because if all you're doing is getting into worldly conversations and, and, and you're speaking world to people who don't know Jesus, all you're going to do is offer, offer them a compromised gospel of Christ. So it's not, a, not an excuse to fill up with the things of the world so you can use them in ministry. <laughs> That's not what this is. Okay? Fill up your life with the truth. Okay? Build a foundation on the word of God. Drench your life in who Jesus is. Live for Christ. Pursue holiness. And when you do that, living for Christ, you'll be able to, if you're looking for it, to grab on in observation things around you that you can use to share, to be bilingual in the world, where you can talk to anybody at any time and just work Jesus into that story, right? So what is it that you know about? What is it in your own personal story that you know about, that you feel comfortable about sharing like, I'm knowledgeable about this. I have a passion for this. I can speak intelligently about this topic. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's about knitting, some of your knitting, right? Are you passionate about knitting? I'm passionate about food. Anybody food, foodie? Oh, my goodness. My wife tells me my, life, my eyes light up when we talk about food. I get into some conversations about some food, okay? Maybe it's food for you. Maybe it's your kids or your grandkids, Right? You have passion about that. You can you see someone else with kids, and you can get into that conversation and reason with them and get on that level and make a connection. Maybe it's sports or, or, or movies or books or, or cars or whatever it is. All right? We got to get out of this tunnel vision and find a common connection with somebody. Because okay? if you roll into Athens, you roll into the break room, you roll into... The place where your neighbor is, and all you're going to be like, I, I don't know how to talk to them. I can't. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Uh, you'll never be able to reach them. Okay. So I look around. I, I see your idols. I, I see what you're into. And because I know a little about that, I'm going to be able to speak to you about Jesus in a way that you can understand. We can get on that same wavelength and and, and give you that answer of what it is you're searching for. Okay. Two more quick things, and we'll start to wrap this up. So Paul shifts gears in verse 29. If you want to look at verse 29 with me. And he says, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. So he's saying this, this God who created us, he must be intelligent, right? He must have understanding like we are. He's, he's like us. He's not some some idol that you can just create. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands people everywhere to repent. So in the old days, you know, you just get a pass because Jesus wasn't born yet. But in these days, Jesus has appeared. Jesus walked the earth. He was with us. Christ has 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 been here. Revelation has happened. The Son of Man walked the earth. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? So there's no longer an excuse. What is God saying to us? Saying there's proof of this. See, God isn't asking you to take a leap in the dark. He's not asking your neighbor to take a leap in the dark. He's given us undisputable proof of the resurrection of Jesus. So in the ancient days, we could say, I didn't know. And so I created this idol, and I worshiped that. But in these days, we're saying, Jesus came. He was here. He lived the perfect life. He took our sin to the cross. He was buried, and by the power of God, raised to new life on the third day. So we no longer had the excuse to say, I'm going to worship this thing, or this possession, or this person, or this job, or, or, or this money, or even myself. Why? Because by his resurrection, Jesus has proven who he said he is. He is Savior and He is Lord. So God isn't asking you. He's not asking your neighbor to just run off a cliff and take a leap of faith. 
He's asking us to walk into the empty tomb. And lastly, what this says to us is that every single one of us has a big decision to make. If you're hearing this today, you have a decision to make. The Old Testament says it this way in Deuteronomy 30. That God has set before you life and death. He set life and death before Adam. He set life and death before you and me. See, God's not looking to railroad anybody. He's giving us a choice. He's setting before you the choice of life or the choice of death. And so he says, therefore, choose life and live. And so Paul says here to the Athenians in verse 31 that God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. That's Jesus. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising Jesus from the dead. So, so God is going to get the last say. And every one of us is going to go on record. Every one of us is going to go on record, either having received the grace of God in Christ or having rejected the grace of God in Christ. Every one of us are going to make that choice, to choose life or to choose death. Because some people will get to make that choice while they're still alive. Paul wrote it this way in Romans 10, and this is how we're going to close this morning. He said, the word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. That if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek. There's, there's no difference between day one at Pentecost and this day standing before the Areopagus. There's, there's, there's no difference between the people of Athens and the people of Painesville. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God has given us the kingdom message, friends. And it's, inv it's an invitation. It's an invitation for you and me into a life with him through his son, Jesus Christ. And that invitation is on the table for every single one of us here this morning. Choose life or choose death. But understand, as the people of God, that's also the message that we're commanded to carry to the world. By the power of the Spirit, Jesus has given us that, 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 that command, that power, that message, that calling to go to the ends of the earth and tell everybody Jesus is alive. Jesus is life. Jesus is hope. Jesus is peace. Jesus is salvation. So that somebody, anybody, everybody, all of us and everybody else can have a chance at a face-to-face, life-changing meeting with Jesus Christ. That's the goal of the church. That's our calling. That's our job. If you're a follower of Jesus today, that's your instructions. That's the marching orders that you and me have been given. If you don't know Jesus today, this is your chance at life. 